First Kings chapter 18, we're going to read 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, and then we'll read uh, 41 and 46, and uh, it's going to be great. I'm excited. In a minute, I'm going to have my wife pray over this service. I want you to know, leading a church is a team effort, and my wife uh, carries such a great load, and uh, I love her so much. And I'm going to tell you, my wife's a powerful, uh, powerful woman of the Lord. And you're blessed with a great pastor's wife. Don't you love your pastor's wife on this Sunday morning? And uh, I get a lot, a lot of credit, but really it all goes there. Amen. First Kings 18. If you're there, say amen. Amen. If the screen, there you go. Man, y'all beat the screen, people. You're getting fast. Uh, sword drill winners. How many of you ever done a sword drill? Remember sword drills? Man, those were fun. Now we've got iPhones. It wouldn't be fair. You know, hey, Siri, take me to... <laughs> Amen. But we know the Siri would beat the Android people. Right, Brother Jared? Amen. God bless Apple. And it came to pass after... That's inside joke. Amen. But Brother Jared Nash does have an iPhone. Where's Brother Jared at? Brother Jared? Oh, he's right there. Brother Jared has purchased an Apple phone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is monumental... <laughs> Uh, for him. <laughs> and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go, show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria. Amen. 41, verse 41, and Elijah, amen. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat. There it is. And drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab, so Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And to Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servants, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth, read it with me, a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand and he said go up say unto Ahab prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and read this with me and there was a a great rain a great rain a little cloud and a great rain. Look at your neighbor and say, it was a little cloud, but a great rain. Lord, I love you. I thank you for who you are and what you've done. You've been really, really good. And today, Father, we look for a great rain, for an outpouring of your spirit in our lives, perhaps from the most inconsequential things, from the things we've overlooked, from the small things in our lives that yield had the biggest benefits and rewards. I thank you, Lord, that you've entrusted us with your spirit, Father, allowing us to know you as our Father and that you call us your sons and daughters. And Father, today as you've honored me with the responsibility of breaking the bread of life, I pray so that I would do so, Lord, aware that the hands, dear God, the people that sit before me are eternal beings and that, Lord, I, I need your word. Oh God, I need your word. I need your word. There's someone here today that's lost. But Lord, through the preaching of the word, I pray that they would give their lives to you. And eternity would be altered in someone's life today. In the wonderful name of Jesus, why don't we begin to give the Lord praise. What we're doing here today has eternal consequences. Come on, the church can't get it wrong. Come on, there's no redo on eternity. You either get it right or you get it wrong. And I'm thankful that we are here today in a truth preaching church. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. As you're seated, why don't we put our hands together and give the Lord a great praise. Amen. That was not a great praise. That was like a patty cake, about 37% of you. Come on. <laughs> All right. It is here in our reading today that Elijah begins there in the 18th chapter of this first book of Kings that Elijah has a vision. It is after three and a half years of, of drought that God gives him a vision, a dream. He says there's going to be an abundance of rain, an abundance of rain. Now, the interesting thing about this is that as soon as God said it's going to rain, 
the Bible says there was a sore drought in the land. It's going to rain, and so he sends a drought. I've learned that many times this is how God works. He promises a flood and sends a famine. We're not going to be real deep or complex. I'm just going to encourage somebody today. Is that all right? And God has a way of stepping into the bleakest of situations and promising the most amazing victories. But He doesn't promise a flood while it's raining. He doesn't promise to harvest when you see buds on the tree. He promises rain when the dry earth is scorched and parched and, and, and you can't even find a tree. You can't even find a plant. He said there's going to be a great harvest. Uh, he, he, that's the way God works. Uh, he, he works so that when it's complete, there's no doubt that was God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can say that. I know what you're preaching, preacher. I've lived there. It was Gideon that in Judges 7 and 2 that, that, that God said, the people that are with thee are too many for me. He said, you've got too much stuff. You've got too many people. He said, you have too much in order for me to work. He said, you're too strong for me to step in. He, he looked down at Gideon and said, you don't need me. Come on. Sometimes we say, Lord, I need you. He says, no, nah, you, you don't need me. No, I need you. So he starts taking stuff out of our life. We're like, what are you doing, God? He said, well, you said you needed me. Come on. And so he sends a flood and we can be complaining about that. Or we could be saying, God, maybe you took away some stuff so you could do some stuff that's supernatural. I say, take whatever you got to take people. Take people out of my life. Let relationships fall and crumble. Leave me by myself if you've got to. But Lord, whatever you do, work in my life. Work in my life. I know, I know we've got it figured out. And we, we want, see, we want God to be a team member of our team. But God, God, he said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to have to cut some players and I'm going to have to cut you as the coach. I'm going to let go of the owner and the manager. I'm just going to leave a few people on the team so there'll be somebody to witness how awesome I am. That's what he, he, come on, that's what he told Gideon. He said, leave a few guys. Why do I need those guys? I'll tell you why. So there'd be somebody to tell us about the goodness of the Lord. Uh, he can do it. Uh, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all. Oh, and he's going to get all the glory. He said, I'm not going to share it with anybody else. Uh, if you want to get some of the glory, you ain't going to have me in it. But if you'll be willing uh, to say, God, you did it. It was because of you. Uh, then you can come on. Then he said, I'll step in. I'll step in. Paul, Paul understood it. He, he understood that, 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 and the Bible says he had a thorn. We don't know what it was. But, uh, some say that it was because he was blind and couldn't see. Uh, we, we don't know wh what it was. Um, but uh, can you imagine? Here you are, the apostle Paul, this great apostle. And you can't see, you've got somebody to help, have to help you get up on the platform and help you walk around. And, and, and it bothered him. He said, God, if you could just, you're, I'm preaching about how powerful you are. I'm this great man of God, and I've got to lean on some servant. I've got to have a CNI dog to help me. I'm preaching about how God can heal the blind, and I'm blind. But finally, he figured it out. He figured out why he was so powerful for God. And he said this in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. He figured out the reason I'm so strong is because I can't see so well. The reason God's so great in me is because, come on. So he says, most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory. That means bo boast. That means rejoice he says I'm going to rejoice what am I going to rejoice in in mine infirmities in my that word infirmities in, in Greek means to feebleness of mind or or in my frailty in my another word could have been my disease in my disease in my sickness or in my, my weakness. Uh, so what Paul did when he got sick, what Paul did in the hospital room, what Paul did when he got the bad report, now he had to learn it. He, it didn't come first off, but the longer you live for God, uh, you figure it out. There's a reason. Uh, oh God, <laughs> I'm in the hospital. This is an opportunity for you to work a miracle. Ah, he, come on, he can't heal what's not sick. He can't fix what's not broke. He can't put back together what hasn't fallen apart. So when it starts falling apart, Part. And when my body's raked with pain, I say, Lord, I'm going to give you praise that the power of God may rest upon me. 
Hallelujah. So I take pleasure. He said, I found pleasure in my pain. Woo. Come on. He said, I take pleasure in my affirmities, uh, in reproaches, in necessity, in persecution. This is a mature Christian. This is a Christian giving God praise uh, when they lose their job. Come on, you've been saying, God, I need a raise and I need a better job. And then you lose your job and you start complaining. How's God going to give you a better job if you won't trust him to let go of the one you got? Come on, how's he going to give you more? God saved my family. All of a sudden you get sick and everything starts going to hell. And that's how God's going to utilize uh, your, your salvation of your kids. Uh, but you complain. Hey, friend, I say, Lord, I'm going to start rejoicing when negativity happens. That's a mature Christian. Faith uh, isn't celebrating the pay raise. Faith is celebrating the loss that gets you there. Faith is clapping your hands. Uh, come on. Uh, when your legs don't work. Uh, waving your arms. when you Come on. Uh, when you don't know what's going on in your life. Uh, for when I'm weak, he said, for when I am weak, then, whoo, shakaramahaya, when I'm weak, when I'm weak, when life doesn't make any sense, when I'm confused and I'm in pain, that's truly the place of strength in my life. The Bible tells us the story, how many of you remember the story of Jarius' daughter? Jarius' daughter, three people, four man, guys. We do this every week. Last week it was Jonah, or week before it was Jonah. I'm like, how many of y'all know the story of Jonah? Welcome. To, look at your neighbor. Hit your neighbor. Hit your neighbor. Say, we're in church. We're in church. Welcome to church. Welcome back to church. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all at the grocery store. Some of y'all, y'all been all kinds of places sitting there. Hey, man. Jarius' daughter, her dad, who is a ruler, a, a, a great man, comes to uh, Jesus and uh, he says, Jesus, my daughter's, my daughter's dying. She's on her deathbed. And uh, Jesus, now we know, how many you, could Jesus have healed her on the deathbed? He could have. He could have healed her on the deathbed. But you know what? A doctor could have healed her on the deathbed too. And then who would have got the glory, him or the doctor? You know us. We'd have been giving glory to the doctor. Well, thank God for that medicine. So you know what happened? He let her die. She died. And in verse 49 of Luke 8, And while he yet spake, there cometh, cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. A servant came from uh, Jairus' house and, and said, uh, uh, said, She's dead. She's dead. Uh, it's, it's over. Uh, don't, don't, don't bother Jesus anymore. That, what, what is the solution, the servant's solution for this impossible situation? What does he offer Jairus? He says, trouble not the master. He says, your daughter's dead. Stop bothering the master with the impossible. <laughs> don't harass, that's another word could have been used there, harass the healer. Don't, 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 don't bother Jesus with this. This is a situation that Jesus would be bothered by. He, he, the servant believed that death was trouble to Jesus. Jesus, he, see, here's why, because he limited God's power. He said, death is trouble to the master. But, but how, how, servant, I have a question for you. How do you know what troubles Jesus? How do you know what he calls trouble and what he calls good? The bottom line is he's just got limitations on God. And you think your situation's so big and it's so bad and it's so ugly and so dark that Jesus is troubled by your situation. Your daughter's dead and dying and, 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 and this now that she's, she's, in a, she's, she's gone, there's no breath in her lungs, God's confused. So you know what? I'm just going to stop asking God about that. I'm just going to leave him alone. I don't, I don't want to ask God, you know, because I don't want to make Jesus look bad. Come on. 
I don't want to ask him, and he's got more important things, but the truth is you're just afraid to believe that maybe he could raise the daughter from the dead. And so my solution and the enemy's solution is leave him alone. Quit believing. Settle. Take a step back. Learn to live without your baby. But look at Luke chapter 8 verse 50. When Jesus heard it, what did he hear? What did he hear? He heard the servant saying, he can't do it. He heard the gossip that said he quit believing. He heard the give, I call it the give up gossip. That's, that's the enemy and that's our solution for every conflict and everything that happens in our life. Give up, quit believing. Learn to live with less. Give up, give up, give up. But, but, but he heard them say it's impossible. He heard it. Look, look what he does. And he answered him. He answered him. I don't see where they ever ask a question. But he is the answer even to the questions you don't have the faith to ask. He answered. What did he answer? They never asked him anything. The truth is there's some things we question. We don't even have the faith to put them out of our mouth. But in your mind, you're saying it's impossible. In your mind, you're saying there's no way it could ever happen. In your mind, you've already thought, I'm just going to learn to live like this. This is how it's going to be. But he answers the questions that you've got in your mind. And he said, he said, fear not. Ooh, I've come to preach to the questions in your mind. I've come to preach to the questions. You don't even have the courage to ask your husband. You don't even have the courage to ask your pastor. You say, I'm just going to believe. I can't believe that big. But he's the answer. And he said, fear not. Don't be afraid. But believe that I can do the things that you think I can't. Come on, there's some things you're afraid to even say. God can't do it, but you've thought it. Yeah, you have. We've all thought it. The ruler thought it. The servant thought it. But Jesus is the answer to the thoughts of doubt. I preach against every thought that has come against. I'm preaching against it in the name of Jesus. Every thought in the mind of a believer that's risen up against the principal. Oh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Every prince, every principality, every ruler in high places. I command you to come down in the name of Jesus. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can ask Woo, that means he can read your mind baby he can do bigger than what you've ever even thought not bigger than what you said he works bigger than what you can think Ooh, some of you just need to start thinking faith come on you ought to start thinking faith you don't have the courage to say it but you can think it maybe God can maybe God can maybe God can Woo. you, you got to believe the reason death came the reason the drought came the reason fear entered was, was God had a had a reason, not that God was going to leave me, but God was going to complete me. Amen. Come on, because the Bible says, she said, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made. That means she wasn't complete until, now she was alive, she had been alive, but she had not been whole. Come on, there's a lot of people living alive, but they're not whole. And so God has to kill some things and he has to take some things away, uh, take us to a low place. Uh, but when you come out of the low place, Brother Lowry, when you come out uh, by the cow gill, things are whole. There's a completeness. Uh, I had to go lose some stuff to complete my life. Uh, I had to lose some people. But since they left, uh, there's a completeness. Uh, he's made me whole. And so you start to see how he works. It is God that delights in working where man's man cannot work. God delights in bringing answers to situations that, that stump men. God delights in doing what man says can't be done. He says, my glory, I'm not going to share it with anybody else. Uh, he specializes, we say it all the time, but he specializes uh, in doing the... As a matter of fact, I'd special, I think he only specializes in the impossible. He only does the impossible. 
If you can do it, God won't. Look at your neighbor and say, if you can do it, God won't. So now look at him and say, so if it ain't got done, it's because you haven't done it. Come on. See, some of us get to Jesus and we think Jesus is a personal, personal assistant. Oh, hey, Jesus, um, I need you to do the laundry today. Uh, I can't believe I got the Holy Ghost and my shoes aren't getting picked up. I can't believe my kids got the Holy Ghost and they're still saying things and doing, th come on, somebody. Like Jesus is, or he's either Santa Claus. Jesus, I need you to give me a new car. Man, I'm a Christian. I need this. I, I, I want this. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And Jesus didn't provide me a meal. I was wanting a filet mignon, bacon wrapped with blue cheese on it. Jesus didn't give me nothing. No, he gave you two hands. Put you in America where you can get a job. The reason you're hungry is because you don't have a job. Go get a job. He's not your chef. Now, if there's no bread anywhere in the world, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And he'll, he'll come up with a way to get oil into a pot and meal. In a, oh, he'll take care of you. Don't worry, the manna can come out of heaven. But as long as you can get a job, you got two arms uh, and get a paycheck, he's not going to be your chef. Uh, he's not going to show up and make, come on, your bed every morning. He's, my marriage is messed up. God ain't doing it. You know why? Because you need to get to a marriage counselor. Come on. Yeah, you do. Oh boy, it got quiet there. I was talking about man and far from him. Y'all like, woo! Then I'm like, you got to go to marriage counseling. You're like, oh. well, come on. I've been asking God. You know what God gave you? Gave you somebody that knows how to help you through it. But you're too proud to ask for help. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to be honest. We don't have time. I've only got an hour. I don't have time to be polite all the time. We just got to get right to the point. If, now, if y'all want to be here three hours, I can make it real sweet. How many of you want me just to shoot straight so we can go home and have lunch? All right, good. So, go get it. Hey, you got marriage problems? Go in the multitude of counselors. Scripture says there's wisdom, but but so if you can't, if you can do it, God probably isn't going to do it. But if you can't, if you're at a place where only God can. I said, if you're at a place where only God can with men, he said, it might be impossible, but with God. I know you know it. You've heard it your whole life. you got a bumper sticker. It's on a t-shirt. But you need to hear it again. With men, it's impossible. But with God. So if you need God in your situation, there's going to have to be some impossibles. There's going to have you go. Come on. You're going to have to let God set you up with the thing that no man can do. But I say, Lord, put this church, put my life in a place where you're the only option so that you can get the glory. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to just give him praise. If you're looking for the impossible, I believe in the impossible. But it's only possible with God. Hallelujah. It is so that God speaks increase and multiplication to us during times of loss and barrenness. It's where faith comes in. You must believe. I must believe. God spoke to Abram and he gave him a great promise. And then guess what happened? There was a famine. <laughs> he spoke to Joseph and gave him a dream. And then guess what he did? He threw him in a pit. David was anointed king of Israel. And then the next 15 years he sits in a uh, feeding sheep on the side of a hill. The widow woman was promised increase by Elijah. But then she prepared, scripture says, to die. God promised he would bring a living, breathing army back to life. But all Ezekiel had were dry bones. <laughs> Whew. after Jesus was baptized and the Holy Ghost descended on him he was led into a wilderness God's promises followed normally by proving grounds I said the promise is normally found uh, followed by a proving ground the promise usually comes with a test nine times Abram's tested and we call him the father of faith why? because he just kept passing the test Father Abraham, I'll tell you why he was the father of the faithful, because he kept passing test after test after test after test after. When's it going to stop, Pastor? Never going to stop. It's a continual process of putting you in an impossible place until you finally learn, whoo, this is good. God's about to do something in my life. It's a test. 
of faith. And Elijah here now has a vision that God has given him of an abundance of rain. God didn't promise a sprinkle. You know what I mean? See, the God, God likes to do God-sized things. So when he does start blessing you, Brother Branham, it's going to be big. It's going to be a flood, but you first got to go through a drought. The drought, don't, the flood don't, I, and the truth is, I don't want just some spring. Some people are like, well, I'm just happy with a little dew on the grass. He didn't promise some, a heavy dew or a, a little quick shower. He promised an abundance. Oh, somebody ought to shout abundance. But before I can be abundant, I have to go through a time of dryness. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you've gone through. I know the church has gone through some t things and people have gone, it's talking to this many people, I don't have to be a prophet. I can just be a person and know there's some people going through some dry times. But let me tell you something about the dry time. The dry times are set up for the flood time, for the rain time, for the overflow and for the abundance time. Oh, preacher, we've heard that all the time. I know you've been hearing it, but you still can't clap to it. I'm like, y'all are going to be abundantly blessed. Man, if I could just get home and get that roast done, I'd be good. <laughs> but you got to remember, right after the vision, they saw nothing. And there had been a drought already for three and a half years. And so the first obstacle to faith that faith had to overcome was history. Three and a half years of nothing. And now this servant... Uh, now the servant is looking and, and it's still nothing. It's, ladies and gentlemen, it hasn't rained. And why on earth, preacher, are you going to say it's going to rain now? It's always been this way. What makes you think things are going to change now? He's been like this ever since I married him. She, I got here, guys. She's been like this ever since I married her. There you go. We're, I've grown accustomed to the famine. Don't try to make us think that we can feast now. It's been like this for longer than you ever were here. Where have you been? You're just a new guy showing up. Uh, it's always been this way, and so it's always going to be this way. We've had, come on, I've had plenty of people through the years come through and tell me it's going to rain and nothing happened. I mean, let's just be honest. They've been telling us for years we're going to have revival. They told me for years my family was going to be saved. But whenever God desires to move in a group of people who have been used to things being a certain way, He has to overcome the mindset that things can never change. That's why when I said you're going to be abundantly blessed, you went, Ugh. Because in order for you to be abundantly blessed, you got to get over the mindset uh, of your history. Uh, and he said, uh, and he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Uh, they looked at him and said, no, it's impossible. It's always been like this and you can't do it. Uh, but once the curse of history can be broken, uh, then God can bring an abundance. Uh, if just for one moment you could believe, uh, if for one moment you could receive, uh, if for one moment you could believe, uh, the abundance comes if you could just believe. I know the history says uh, three and a half years of failure means uh, it's going to be three more years of failure. And 22 years of hell in my marriage uh, means 22 more. But what if it's not true? Uh, what if, uh, oh, what if there's an abundance of rain? Uh, what if there's love like you've never had it before? And hope, uh, oh, that you've never experienced in Abraham. Uh, Abraham was old, the Bible says in Genesis 24. And when he was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord blessed Abraham in all things, then Abraham took a wife, and her name was Kethra. How many, how many sons did Abram have? Tell me, quickly. Nope, he didn't have two. He had more than two. It was hard to get him to believe the one. He, he struggled to believe for Isaac. He tried to do it his own way and made a big mess. But when he, come on, for years, it's bumping a hundred years, I can't have a boy. But finally, he got the boy. And once he got the boy, then Abraham took a wife and named her Kethra. And she bare him Zimaran, somebody say one. And Jokan, two. And Medan, three. And Midian, four. And Ishbak, five. And Shusha. Abraham had a whole lot more sons after Isaac. It was just getting him to believe for the first son. And if you could just believe that in spite of the last 100 years, nothing's happened, that something could happen. You'll open the windows of heaven. 
for an abundance. Come on, how you going to pick on your nails and stick your finger up your nose during that point? You ought to be on your feet saying, yeah, oh, that's for me. That's for me. I'm preaching to somebody's history to say it's possible. Woo, I know I'm old. I know I'm old. But if God can do it for a hundred-year-old man, he can do it for a guy that's 102. If he can do it for a girl. Somebody ought to give him praise for the thing that you've given up on. Come on, you ought to just believe again for the thing that you stopped believing for. Come on, I believe 2018 is going to be the year as Brother Herring prophesied of the open door. What door is going to open? The door you've been looking to open for years. The thing you've been asking God for, but your mind is given up on. But God's going to revive it this morning. And I'm going to believe God again in 2018. I'm going to believe God for the thing I've been afraid to pray for and even ask for. The thing I've locked away and in my mind I believed is impossible. I'm believing again this year. I'm going to knock again. Believing the door will be opened unto me. Woo. I've been preached to and told it's going to rain. Only to wake up the next morning and look across the plain of what used to be a grassy front yard to find a desert place. It's been three and a half years of cloudless skies and bright sunrises. And, but no rain has come, preacher. I don't know what you're talking about. And so your faith goes, this is it. Your faith goes up and you get a word and then it crashes back down. And, and just as the Bible says that after the promise, uh, there was a famine after the promise. Uh, God makes you and I, puts you in a place of famine in our lives. But don't stop looking. Don't stop looking. And then that servant... He went up and he looked and he saw a cloud. He wasn't positive about it. He went, now he went the first time, he didn't see nothing. It's been three and a half years. And then on top of that, he's got to look six times. Somebody needs to look again. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you need to look again. You need to look again. No, no, look, look at your neighbor and say, no, I said look again. What am I looking for? You're looking for the thing that you've been missing because you said it was too small. <laughs> he came back and the preacher said, what do you see? Well, ain't nothing much. Are you sure there ain't nothing? Well, there, there's, it, there's this one little tiny cloud. It's about the size of a man's hand, but I, I, I don't need a man. I need God. Woo! <laughs> but maybe God has sent a man. Maybe the person you've given up on. Maybe God's going to use the person, the boss that you hate. Come on, the situation that you hate. Maybe it's the size. Of, but I've come to tell you, quick, small things get big when you put God in them. It might be a little cloud, but there's a great rain coming, baby. See, there's some people can look at little things and find every reason why it's not God. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, how can be God? It's impossible, you know. But then there's other people. And this is a church of these kind of people. That's the truth, Bishop. All week long, I get calls. And they're like, you ain't going to believe it. I found a penny on the street. I'm about to be a millionaire. Come on, I had a mom call me and say, oh, my, 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 my daughter's husband got sick, got the flu. I believe this is what's going to bring him back. I'm serious. That's, I get these all week long from you people. Sometimes I'm like, it's just a penny. It's just the flu. But you know what I say? I say it's a, a cloud. <laughs> 
And when I see, come on, when I see a quarter laying in front of me on the street, that might just be the miracle blessing to my father. Oh, somebody ought to not look, despise not. Come on, despise not the, the day of small. You got to have small things because it's in the small. Somebody this year, you got to pull back the lens. Oh, and look at things that you like you've never looked at them before. You ought to start believing God to do great things out of small things. Met the greatest harvest in East Gate. It's going to come, you know, where? From the place we don't expect it. From the little things we've neglected. But when we do them, there's a great rain coming out of a small cloud. Somebody ought to stand to your feet and give God. Come on, give him a praise. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. God promised Abraham as many children as there are sands on the sea, but all he gave him was one kid. And then he gave him some more, but out of that one came a nation. Jesus fed 5,000 people, but what did he start with? Y'all don't know this story? Are you kidding me? 5,000 people fed with two fish and little cloud. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a little cloud. <laughs> But God's in it. <laughs> he made the whole earth uh, and he started it by saying, uh, let there be light. And out of that voice uh, came everything we've ever going to need. Yeah. Woo, little cloud. Great rain. But if I'm going to harvest it and if I'm going to feel it and if I'm going to live in abundance, I've got to start believing and doing things I've never done before. When Lazarus died, Jesus wept, the Bible says. And then he went to where Mary and Martha were. It's interesting. There he is. He shows up. Martha's ticked off. Mary's weeping, worshiping him. He says, take me, take me to the, take me to the, what do you say? Take me to the place where you, you laid him. And when they got to the tomb, what was going on? What was there? A stone. What'd he say? He said, take away the... It's kind of crazy. Same dude that can raise the dead, but you telling me he can't move a stone? Come on. He's unlocking the doors for Peter of prison cells. He's like, it's like the doors at Walmart. He's, he's, Peter shows up. Door. Door. You know Peter getting out of prison. You remember that story? And then he gets to the, the church people's house, and there's the door, and he just steps up in front of it. Well, why that door ain't open? It's just a little door. All the big doors open. Because you got to knock on that door, Peter. Because that door can be opened from somebody. There's somebody that can do that, and if somebody else can do it, God ain't going to do it. And Lazarus, Mary and Martha saying, I, I ain't going to do that. He said, but if you can do what's possible, he said, I'll do... I'll speak life into that stinky grave. And when he comes out, hey, you tell, they, he said, loose him. Take his, take his grave. You're telling me he couldn't take the grave clothes off? No, he can take grave clothes off. But he's not going to. That's your job. And your job in 2018 is to roll back stones. Come on, somebody. Your job is to start. Oh, you hear the knocking. You got to open the door. Peter, what you've been praying for, church, is on the other side. You just got to. Well, if it's God's will, he'll open the door. It's God's will. You've got to open the door. You've got to start believing that behind the stone, there's a miracle. It's a little thing, but it's a great storm coming. I've come to oh, ask somebody to believe again in 2018, whether for a family member, finances, friends, relationship. I don't know the thing that you no longer pray for because you don't want to trouble God. But today we're going to revive it and we're going to believe God because I believe our revival is much greatly linked to the thing that we pass by and we've said, so oh, it's insignificant. It's not much. The man at the gate in Acts 3 was a lame man laid there every day. People walked by him every day. The whole church walked by him. But Peter and John said, nah, there's something in this guy. Now, I'm gonna, I, he might just be a little nothing or a nobody, but there's something in this guy. I'm going to find value in people this year uh, that I've never seen before. And God's going to open your eyes. Uh, that might be, come on, that guy was the first worship leader in the church. 
first aisle runner. Yeah, he ran the aisles, the Bible says. Somebody said, I don't know why y'all run the aisles. Because they ran the aisles in the Bible. Come on, if you're going to church and ain't running the aisles, well, you ain't got an Acts 3 kind of church. They were jumping in that. Come on. Because two preachers said he might look little and it might seem insignificant, but maybe there's something greater in that boy. And you've been looking at, come on, some of you have written your kids off. Maybe, maybe you just need to come back around and say, I know they messed up and they're lame and they're broken. And I know they stink inside that tomb and they're dead. And I know my daughter's dead and, and I shouldn't trouble you with these things. But God, the impossible has never been trouble for you. Where you're at right now, if you would just reach over and grab somebody by the hand. I want you to look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm about to go up and believe. Come on, I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe in 2018. Take him by the hand. Bring him to the front right now and begin to pray with them all across the building. Begin to speak life over this year. Begin to speak victory over this year. What thing have you neglected? What is it, the small thing that you have wiped away is insignificant what is that thing that you say you don't say it you think it's impossible lift up your voice oh, come on there's a God and he hears you but he's the God of impossibility he's the God that takes the little things and makes them great he's the God that removes stuff and people and things out of our lives in order to do those things that no man can do in our lives he's a God that opens up the floodgates of heaven uh, after three and a half years of drought and six services where nothing happens. And, and I went to church six times in a row uh, and I didn't feel him. And I went up to the altar six times, but I didn't get it. Uh, come on up a seventh time. Uh, but I've been praying three and a half years, preacher, and it still hasn't been healed. Uh, come up again. Oh, uh, Rakashi, I tell you. Come on, preacher, last year I started the year off believing. Uh, uh, I think it's best I don't believe. No, the devil is a liar. Come on, say to God, believe again. Believe again, believe again. Believe again, believe again. Look at the thing that seems small to you. Come on, somebody seeking direction in the building today. Come on, you came and you're looking for direction. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. You're looking for direction. Come on, you're trying to find a...